The levels here, okay? Need uh -huh. you to rise to the occasion. Hey everyone, welcome to North Courts. It's going to be a lot of Canada men's and women's basketball content for you here today. And we are going to get right into the men. Obviously, a very disappointing defeat in the semifinals. 103-101 in overtime, falling to the Czech Republic. You got to respect the Czech Republic. They came out with an excellent game plan and got it done. Javon, first things first, we talked about what the weaknesses were going to be for this Canada men's squad. Size and shooting, those were exposed in that game. But the other thing we talked about was the FIBA know-how, that FIBA institutional knowledge of understanding how to play the game. What are the specific things that this Canada team needs to learn going forward? I think one, you know, just creating their own identity, because as we've learned when you're watching Greece, when you're watching the Czech, when you've seen Turkey play over this tournament, you realize how well these teams move the basketball. That's, that's the European way. That's the European culture of, of playing, uh, you know, their way, their philosophy, their brand of basketball. Um, and I think Canada can adapt that style a little more, but it's, it's tougher. It's, you know, a lot of these guys playing the NBA, it's more of a one-on-one -on -one game. And then, you know, you think about the fact that there's, there's no defensive three seconds. So these guys are used to attacking and there'd be no, there, there being nobody in the key, them being able to finish at the basket or really just make things happen on their own. In the FIBA game, it's a lot different. So I think that's one of the ways to, one of the things that you have to adapt and adjust to. But again, it's one or the other. You either create your own identity or you adapt there. And I think they have the ability to do both with the talent that they have, the skill that they have, and the level of IQ. It's just going to take this team coming together and some continuity and just playing together, getting some exhibition games together and so forth, and just knowing each other. Because again, this is the talented group, but this is the first time that this group has played together. It can't be like that going forward. Now, Megan, looking at this group, uh, you look at what the size was for the Czech Republic and you think about some of the names that were missing uh, in that front court. Kelly Olynyk, Kem Birch, Chris Boucher, Brandon Clark, another one, Tristan Thompson. You're thinking, oh man, he would love to have any one of those for that game. Some fans will watch Slovenia make it to the Olympics and see Luka Doncic go out in the first round, then go represent Slo Slovenia and get it done. Drop 31, 11, and 13 to get them over the hump in that final game. What do you say to those fans who are saying maybe, hey, those guys didn't want it as much as, say, a Luka? Respectfully, don't watch these guys' banks account bank accounts. Point blank, period. There's a difference between a Luka Doncic and a Ken Birch, a Chris Boucher, a Brandon Clark, a Tristan Thompson, and a Kelly Olynyk. Those guys are fighting to try and get a contract to continue playing their professional game in the NBA. They're trying to remain on an NBA roster. Luka Doncic is waiting for a super match. He could have gotten hurt while playing for Slovenia. And I can, you know, I'm not a betting woman, but if I was, I'd be pretty comfortable betting that uh, Mark Cuban would still give him the Supermax <laughs> because of what he means to that organization and to the Dallas Mavericks roster and the way they play. He's that important. That is no disrespect to the likes of the Canadian guys who were not able to suit up because they are trying to get on a roster, as I said. It's just completely different money that we're dealing with. And at the end of the day, I'm never going to count someone else's money because I wouldn't want them to count mine. I'm not going to tell these guys what to do. I'm not going to beg them to give up their livelihoods to commit to their country. Now, I get it. We want them to play for Canada. We want them to don the maple leaf and wear the red and white. We all get that. I understand it. But at the end of the day, unfortunately, when it comes to their daily lives, paying their bills, supporting their families, and living their life, Canada basketball does not pay them and pay their bills. So they have to go elsewhere to get money. We have to respect their decisions, no matter whether it's good or bad for the rosters. At the end of the day, yes, we want them to play for Canada, but we have to respect the fact that when they aren't wearing the Maple Leaf, they're wearing another logo and playing for another team, and that's how they get paid because that is their job. 
So, and I wanted to add to that, Megan, because I, I think a lot of times these guys are cru crucified and scrutinized for not playing for many of the reasons that you have mentioned. But guess what? You know, let's put some let's put some pressure on the, the basketball fans in Canada. We need to be supporting these guys, you know, every year, uh, supporting these guys when they're 16. Now, Luka Doncic is in Slovenia. He's, he's a hero at the age of 12, 14, 15 because he's coming up in their program and hometown hero for them. And, and the, the community stands behind him and develops these kids, develops these players abroad. We in Canada sometimes just care about these players every four years. That's not the way you build a culture, right? There has to be that support from the grassroots level, from a fundamental standpoint, so that, yeah, then you have more of a say when it comes, you know, four years, five years down the line, and these guys don't show up um, to their national teams because you've invested in them when they were 12, you've invested in them when they're 15, and helped develop them. So we have to continue to stand behind them, support them, and yes, like, you know, we have a talented pool. We have to continue growing that pool, nurturing that pool, and developing these players. Because um, a lot of them, you know, let's, let's call a spade a spade. A lot of them have gone abroad to develop their talents, have reached certain points in, in, in their career, and then now we have expectations for them. That's unfair. If I can piggyback really quickly to V and Javon, another thing is let's keep in mind, the fans also need to keep in mind is the fact that had the pandemic never hit, and I know we can look back and say this, but again, in a perfect world and the pandemic never hit, a year ago, these guys would not have been in the contract situations that they necessarily are in right now. We would hopefully not have an injured Jamal Murray or an injured Shea Gilgis Alexander. We wouldn't have a Dylan Brooks who's not playing because of the run and his decision with, you know, what he's dealing with. We wouldn't necessarily have a Melvin Edgem who had to withdraw himself because of personal reasons. A year ago, this tournament, in my opinion, Javon, I don't know if you'd agree, but I think Canada wins that tournament and it's a completely different conversation that we're having a year ago. Completely different conversation. And, and just to follow up on that again, some, we don't track the other teams. You know, I, I, when I was playing, there's been times where we played up, we played Spain. Um, one of the Gasols were out for contract reasons, family reasons, or injuries, whatever the case may be. So it happens. It happens everywhere. It's just that now we're focused on, you know, Canada, our team here, because there's this slight, not slight disappointment, but there is some disappointment at, with the results. But again, we have to, we have a wide pool. We have to continue to support them because we're, just as much a part of this thing as they are. Hey, you want to track your Canadian talent? There's no place better to do it than the CEBL. So make sure you go watch that. Let's get into some big picture takeaways for this Canada men's team. And I think we can start there in terms of tracking the talent. You need a bigger pool. That was the biggest takeaway for me. And so as this talent continues to expand and you have more players to choose from, you can establish a core group that's going to be present, that's going to be acquiring that FIBA experience and know-how as you go along. And then certain circumstances are going to present themselves where, hey, player X, Y, Z aren't available, but that's okay because you've got ABC available. So Javon, what was your biggest takeaway? Talented group. Talented group. And I think the investment is, is finally there. There's, there's been commitment from guys that you mentioned, Shea. There's been commitment from Andrew Wiggins. There's been commitment from RJ. Now it's time to build on that, continue to build on that, nurture that, and, and build out. I think the, the core group is there, um, you know, and I think it has to be, the plan in place has to be a 12, 16, 20-year plan as opposed to, hey, you have a talented group right now, there's 10 guys, throw them out there, and they should get the job done. That doesn't work in international competition. Canada's gotten better, but guess what? The rest of the world has gotten better as well, and th we have to be cognizant of that. And it's also, it's not the NBA, but... These guys are professionals. These guys that they're playing against are professionals. You, and we also have to take into account the NBA. These guys are 23, 24, 25. RJ is just 21. These guys aren't, aren't in their peak yet. These guys aren't at that. They haven't nearly hit the ceiling where they're gonna where they're gonna max out. These guys have just been drafted two, three years ago. Keep in mind that the NBA drafts on potential um, and, and trajectory. These guys are nowhere near that. They're going up against guys that are 10, 12 year pros that have been doing this, are battle tested, know the nuances of the international game. It's two completely different worlds, and now you, you pull them together and expect these guys to come be successful. Not taking away from it, you know, there's definitely a disappointment. There's, it's definitely a talented group, but we can't reduce and dismiss the fact that they're going up against pros, going up a guy, against guys that are seasoned and veteran to this play. Megan, what was your biggest takeaway? I think, you know, being Javon, to piggyback off what Chef said, it's the, it's the thought that this program is in a good place because they've gone through so much. 
you know, Shep, you've been part of this program. You've seen the ugliness. You've seen the down days, the dog days of summer where you're just fighting to go tournament to tournament. So I think to Javon's point, like these guys are young. Keep in mind, the pool is growing. Like let's, you know, the men haven't had success. Yes, they lost, but let's go support the U19 team who is having success right now. That's where the next generation is. That's the next crop of players that will be entered into the senior men's program. We have to continue to support these guys because when the net, when, when, you know, Shep's generation of guys that are still playing and this generation we're watching right now, when they pass the torch, we're watching the next generation before our eyes right now. We have to continue to support these guys. And I think what Rowan and what Glenn and coach nurse are trying to do with this program is take it in a direction that it hasn't gone before. And when you're trying to do that, there's going to be growing pains. This tournament was one of those growing pains. Yes, it was disappointing, but it was not discouraging. Javon said that throughout the broadcast. This is not a discouraging moment. And the reaction from fans is making it seem like it's discouraging. We should be happy to see that this program is in a good place and is going in the right direction because that's something that we have been wondering. Where is the direction of the senior men's program going? What is the direction we're looking for? And I think the more we have Canadian players continue to play, not just in the NBA, but continue to play overseas in European leagues, in the Greek leagues, in the Italian leagues, in the Spanish leagues, you're going to get that international experience. They're going to come back and they're going to bring that to the program. As much as this was a disappointing tournament, it was not discouraging. This program is going in the right direction and the trajectory is up, not down. And as we switch things up to the women, hey, it is definitely not about the future for them. They are very much here in the present. They will be in Tokyo. They are the fourth ranked FIBA team. They will definitely be in the running for a medal. We saw the roster that was released a week ago. And now we can get to our starting fives, our favorite segment. Megan, hit us up with your five. So first, I want to say to the fans who yesterday, when we mentioned that the women were ranked fourth in the world, um, and, and to you know keep that same energy that they did for the men in the FIBA tournament, going into Tokyo for the women, just because they were ranked fourth in the world, it doesn't mean that they're not going to medal. Because I saw a lot of people saying, well, they're ranked fourth, that means they won't medal. That, that, it doesn't correlate, people. Like, get that out of your mind. It means they're the fourth best team in the world going into Tokyo, okay? Let's just keep that Tokyo same energy that we had for, for in Victoria. Let's keep that same energy in two weeks going into Tokyo. But my starting five, I have Kia Nurse, I have Bridget Carlton to add some scoring punch, especially extending the defense with the three-point shooting that she has. I have the captain uh, and in Kim Gauche, who is able to bring her lovely daughter with her, which that's a whole other conversation that we can probably have as we get set for the Olympics. And then Kayla Alexander and, and Nao Ring Pakakule. That's For me, that's my starting five. I think there's depth, I think there's size, there's athleticism, but there's also that long distance scoring punch, which as we know, when it comes to FIBA, as Javon has told us, you need to be able to knock down the three. Stretch the floor. I gotta go with Kia Nurse, Bridget Carlton, Shayna P, Kayla Alexander, Kay uh, Kayla Alexander, and Kim Gauthier. All right, I've got Shayna Pellington in there as well. I've got her in ahead of Bridget Carlton, just because I feel like I was so impressed with what she did at the America, what she did on that NCAA run. I think that scoring punch that she brings can complement Kia Nurse uh, really well. And so having that cushion of Bridget Carlton off the bench, I think could be a really nice fit. But hey, we'll see what happens in a few weeks. We'll see what Lisa Tomitis has in store for us. Uh, and hopefully we'll be in the running for a medal on that side. That's gonna wrap it up for this episode. We hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't already, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button and we'll catch you in a couple weeks.